Yeah, okay, good. Thanks for the uh, warm introduction there. Uh, really appreciate what you've done to uh, make this platform where we can present this technology to the industry. Uh, so, yeah, we really appreciate that first off and, and also appreciate all the viewers coming on to this webinar today to learn about new technologies for the manufacturing industry for today and into the future. And uh, your new website, Ron, looks great too. I think you've made the VTC attractive for manufacturers seeking growth opportunities through the use of new technology. So for this presentation. So here's our agenda for our presentation. Uh, the uh, focus of our presentation today is to share new technology with next generation Wi-Fi connected assembly tools that can uh, provide real quality benefits to you as manufacturers of heavy vehicles and equipment. While you're watching this presentation, you'll likely be able to relate to some of the challenges encountered when manufacturing your products. And you might wonder, how can you implement this new technology in your company? Please know that Applefast can help you with this integration as we also provide the necessary upstream and ongoing sales and service support to ensure successful implementation at your facility. During uh, VTC's webinar in December, Ron said that he had noticed during meetings with manufacturers in the industry that a common issue was employee training for critical production tasks. In today's presentation, we're also gonna demonstrate how Wi-Fi connected assembly tools can reduce that need for operator training and the costs associated with it while ensuring production of high quality vehicles and equipment. So a little bit about Applefast, who we are. Applefast supplies tool and fastener systems to the heavy vehicle and equipment industry. And while we supply some of the most basic forms of manual riveters and click type torque wrenches, we also supply and support the most advanced fastening systems and lock bolt technologies used in heavy trucks and on highway and off highway trailers and locomotives, train cars and rail systems, as well as mining equipment. And of course, in transit bus and highway coach manufacturing, which is what we're about here today, as well as all types of agriculture equipment, whether it's headers or planters or tillage equipment, and even in commercial or defense aircraft. And we actually work in space exploration too. So Applev has been serving the manufacturing industry since 1974. We are based in Winnipeg. And we're honored to have a long-standing relationship with most manufacturers in Manitoba. And in recent years, we've made renewed efforts to serve manufacturers all the way across Western Canada with the same expertise and passion. We have lots of passion for this industry. In situations where our customers of U.S. facilities, we travel to them and uh, support them remotely as if they were local. So if you're at distance, that's no challenge. We're known to provide quality products that can be relied on. And through the years, we've also closely followed industry trends and have embraced new technologies, investing the time and resources to bring those advancements to our customers. In 2020, we refocused our energies to further define ourselves as leaders by concentrating on the fourth industrial revolution known as Industry 4.0. We've also introduced new capabilities and rivets and riveting as threaded inserts complete with uh, new installation tooling as well. So our team is excited to help anyone overcome their manufacturing challenges and we only succeed when you succeed. So I'd like to thank the new flyer group for their reciprocal support of Applefast as they authorize the time and support of their staff and facilities for this presentation. I'm sure that everybody on the call knows New Flyer. Well, New Flyer acquired Motor Coach in 2015 and has since acquired other leading coach manufacturers, Arbach and Alexander Dennis uh, Plaxton is up here on the slide. As a global producer of vehicles that carry passengers, they understand the responsibility to manufacture world-class quality products for everyday safe transport of persons uh, like you and I. Today, they're focused on all their safety critical applications and Applefast is New Flyer's partner to implement DC electric tools and accessories in all their facilities. In our presentation today, Sheldon Schultz of New Flyer St. Cloud, Minnesota plant will present a working DC tool system and Lance Mladinski of Motor Coach Industries in Winnipeg will also demonstrate a DC tool system with operator guidance and process control. 
So in case you're wondering, I'll also be explaining what a DC electric tool is today. So a DC electric tool is a reliable torque and automation fastening system engineered for precise, accurate, and repeatable torque control. These high performance fastening systems allow manufacturers to optimize the assembly area, reduce labor costs, and increase productivity. More specifically, a DC electric tool has a transducer and a resolver. Now here's where the, the transducer is in the tool and a resolver. The, the transducer is measuring torque and the resolver measures angle. The DC electric brushless motor is programmable so we can set multiple speeds throughout the rundown to accurately approach and achieve target torque. And this gives us our repeatable fastening results. So we start the fastening process with the tools trigger, but typically operate in an assembly process mode that is initiated with barcode scans. Fastening results are displayed to the operator with the onboard OLED color display. And audible beeps can be activated to warn or confirm the operator at the end of the fastening cycle as well. So when they've achieved torque, the results are sent via secure encrypted Wi-Fi back to the controller and onto the database if it's connected to a database. So it gives you a idea of what a DC electric tool is when we're speaking about them in detail further on. So let's take a look at the range of assembly tools available today to explain why DC electric tools are so much better suited for critical fastening. The, the basic impact wrench is a commonly misused tool. It's not an assembly tool. Impact wrenches do not have torque control because they're dependent on air supply and operator skill. The pulse tool is also dependent on air supply, pressure, volume, and cleanliness. And joint conditions also affect the output of a pulse tool. So we often will encounter over torque or under torque failures. The first successful step users can take to control torque is with basic click wrenches and Applefast does supply these. However, it is a slow manual process with ergonomic risks, you know, when we're pulling high torque values and torque wrenches do not provide data. So if you're pre-torquing with an impact wrench and finish torquing with a click wrench, you may be over torquing with the impact wrench and confirming you've met a minimum value with a click wrench, but how do you know if you haven't over torqued that hardware? So the next step in torque control is to use shut off clutch nut runners and the pistol grip or red angle configurations. The challenge with these tools is that we have to order a specific model for a torque range and an output drive size, as well as they have one speed throughout the whole rundown process. So it's hard to achieve torque control in varying joint conditions. And when there's changes coming to the production line all the time, I want you to build multiple products. I want you to change the torque value. Uh, it's not easy to do with pneumatic clutch type tools. So the optimal tools for manufacturing are DC electric tools because we can program the tools direction of rotation, its speed throughout the whole fastening cycle, and its output parameters with torque control and angle control. So this actually allows us to achieve joint monitoring for each fastening cycle. Uh, with the added error proofing accessories, we can uh, minimize operator training, uh, any basic instructions and these error proofing accessories, you can produce a high quality finished product. The software and operator instructions are also part of the operator guidance that is going to be demonstrated today. So this slide shows that DeSouter offers a complete range of DC electric handheld tools. The handheld tools here and the, the fixture tools here. Handheld tools, pretty explanatory. And the fixture spindle 
tools are, are typically mounted in torque control arms, which we're going to see today in Sheldon's video. Or uh, we use them in a fixture where we have more than one spindle so we can do multi spindle synchronized fastening. Of course, quality assurance tools are an important component of advanced fastening systems, which we're going to present in a future webinar. The important thing to understand here is that Applevast offers a complete range of DeSuter products to torque from 0.3 newton meters up to 1900 newton meters uh, to set up and establish any manufacturing facility with the tooling and accessories you need to build a quality product. If you don't use the correct fastening tools, you will experience failures in production or in the field, which brings us uh, to the topic of our first video on a wheel assembly failure. So we're going to play this video here. Thank you. So are you confident that your vehicle and others sharing the roadway have been assembled or repaired with the utmost care so that everybody will make it to their destination safely each and every day? We all saw that wheel hit the, the vehicle there. Sound will come on. The OPP say one man is dead after a wheel assembly from a tractor trailer flew off and struck his van on the Queensway early this morning. Now what we do know is that the driver of a tractor trailer was heading westbound on Highway 17 here near Carling Avenue when a dual wheel assembly set detached. OPP say the wheels jumped the median, it struck the van and it ripped off the roof, killing the driver. Now joining me here is Constable Booth and he's going to explain some of the charges that have been placed in this case. So why don't we start with the driver? What has he been charged with and why? The uh, driver is driving the vehicle that was involved in the incident. So as a result, he's been charged with driving a commercial motor vehicle with a detached part. The detached part being the whole wheel assembly, which came off the vehicle. And now we've also charged a company and what have they been charged with? Yeah, the numbered company from Ottawa has been charged with operating an unsafe vehicle. So that's a pretty uh, devastating video there. Um, brings awareness to all of us as manufacturers. Um, these specific details are from the Ontario Ministry of Transportation, but we'll get back to the presentation. We want to come up with the solutions to prevent these issues in the in the field. So there's a good reason to, to fasten correctly. All of us on this webinar are involved in the industry and we're aware of the many challenges there are in manufacturing. As a baseline, uh, we need to source quality hardware that meets specifications, and then we need to tighten them correctly. So this slide shows some pictures of um, hardware, new hardware that uh, is defective right out of the box. Um, any lubricant uh, or Loctite or thread locker will decrease friction during the tightening. So that changes the effect. We know that uh, stainless steel Hardware has galling issues. Um, split lock washers do not work. That's been proven many times. And uh, deformed thread lock nuts, they pack the plating into threads and uh, prevailing torque increases while we fasten. So that changes the dynamics as well. If you get paint in your threads, that will also increase prevailing torque while you're fastening. And of course, anyone who's remanufacturing, we just remind, then that um, new hardware should be used to achieve accurate uh, torque values. That being said, we can also have catastrophic failures even when good quality hardware is used, but it isn't tightened or installed correctly. So besides the video we watched, these pictures re-emphasize the adverse effects of incorrect fastenings. We got uh, missing hardware here. 
you'll see there's a missing nut. We've got yielded hardware from over torquing. So this may not have been evident uh, during installation, but failed in the field. We've got over torqued and broken hardware causing critical failure. Uh, I actually took this picture at the side of the road last year. It was apparent that the wheel studs had been over torqued and uh, this happened at high speed on the highway. The wheel was, was gone and the wheel studs are broken. This one here is a stripped hardware, so not aligned correctly. Uh, we've got galling again, excessive shear loads uh, from too much force in this fastening connection. And then this fastener here failed from fatigue because it became loose, maybe after joint conditioning. So some of these issues are gonna get through the production lines undetected without the use of DC electric tools. So if you wanna fasten your safety critical applications correctly, you're glad you're here today learning about DC electric tools. This will prevent you dealing with warranty issues. Um, it'll strengthen your brand and it'll prevent that worst case uh, litigation from loss of life that we've just um, seen in the video. So now that we've talked about all the pains, Let's talk about the uh, solutions together. This brings us to the video that we have of Sheldon Schultz of New Flyer uh, presenting this DC torque tool system. In the picture, uh, you'll see we've got a DC electric tool here. This is mounted in a torque control arm and we've got the controller nearby for the operator to see in the workstation. This system is installed at the New Flyer facility in St. Cloud, Minnesota. So the operator is going to scan some barcodes to initiate the process because it is interlocked at the end of each completed assembly. So I'm going to warn you that there's some real life background noise in this video. Um, so we've includes, included closed captions so you can hear what Sheldon is saying in, in the video. Hello, I'm Sheldon Schultz from New Flyer Industries. I'm here to talk to you about DC tool technology that we've been Tightening parameters um, collect and archive data results into our process, um, and we also are able to control torque and angle parameters. Uh, we have all of our safety critical installs set up this way, um, and right now we're going to be using a GCI articulating arm with a DeSuter brand controller and a DeSuter branded tool to tighten our radius rods on an axle. So I'll hand it off to one of our assembly techs, Chris, and Chris will go through that process. So right now Chris is scanning our collection data, which is our assembly process employee badge and also we collect the serial number of the axle. So Chris is releasing the brakes on the arm right now. Uh, the arm is suspending the tool for proper ergonomics and weight and it will also absorb the reaction forces of the tool. So as simple as that, Chris has already got one of the four fasteners tightened with a green light. And you can see on our tool controller, we have two of four completed. To complete the assembly process, there's number three. And there's number four. So we've completed our assembly process, all four. Uh, Assembly actions were completed. That data will be stored in our data archive in our server.
Thank you, Sheldon. That was a great video. Thanks for the accolades there at the end. Um, so I know you're on the webinar and uh, you put a lot of effort into that video, Sheldon. So that was that was great. We could all see how Chris scanned the three barcodes in a specific sequence which allowed him to initiate the assembly process. And then the uh, tool kept displaying green lights, which confirmed that he performed all four in the batch accurately. So the torque arm really helps with the proper ergonomics for the uh, operator because it balances the tool and absorbs all the reaction force from the tool, which is super important and that particular torque arm also has enough reach to swing around and fasten the rear axle bunk assemblies too. So there's added value there for new flyer. And I think everybody would have noticed that the tool is extremely quiet. We also saw that the uh, tool was only applying a, a small amount of fastening at the end of the cycle there. And the tool can do full fastenings or it can do finished torques and it does it all repeatedly. So it does it quickly as well. We can achieve the accurate torque and angle target with the DC tool. I think it was only one minute to do those four fasteners. And then it displayed on the tool and on the controller to provide the feedback to the operator. So he knows where he was during the assembly process. And then at the end, you would have noticed there was a little stop sign appears on the controller screen. And that shows that the system is interlocked until the next axle build comes into the workstation and the operator scans in barcodes to start the next axle build. So that's helpful for the assembly process as well. So this brings us to our next video with Lance Mlodzinski of Motor Coach Industries in Winnipeg. This is a longer video it's about 11, 12 minutes, so bear with us. It's very interesting. Uh, Lance starts off his video with an introduction, but I'm going to tell you that we're demonstrating another DeSouter DC electric tool system that Applefast supplied. However, this system includes operator guidance. So operator guidance that in guides the operator throughout the assembly process for all torque related and non-torque related tasks. These air proofing accessories, any operator could safely build a quality product with minimal training. So we'll get this video started. Hi everybody, I'm Lance Wolginski, Manufacturing Engineering Manager and Senior Technical Advisor for Special Processes here at Motor Coach. One of my responsibilities is to take care of nearly 50 DC tools at both Winnipeg and Pemina manufacturing plants. Why don't we get started? I'm going to give you a quick walk through the system I've got beside me here, uh, starting with this tool. This tool is exactly the tool that we use in Pemina, North Dakota to assemble our junction boxes, including electrical connections uh, for all of our coach models. And after this demo, this tool is destined for our inspection pit, uh, which we're, where it will retorque charge air cooling clamps after road test. That tool is Wi-Fi and it's connected to this controller. The controller is where all the programs are stored and can be called up. And we'll show you how to do that in a few moments. But each of those programs can vary between the torque range of any given tool that you're connecting. After that, we've got an industrial PC. This is required to provide operator guidance. So the programs and the pictures, the content, all resides on that industrial PC, and there's constant communication between the PC and the controller and the tool to keep everything in sync of what's being displayed to the operator. Below that, we've got a basic pick to light system. There's red indicators telling the operator where to pick the parts and sensors inside each bin to detect when that operator's gone to the correct bin. After that, we've got a few things like 
mushroom buttons to continue different processes that aren't torques. We've got a crane pendant here, a wireless crane pendant. We'll show you how that works and as part of the process. The operator's got a couple build stations here uh, to help the process. After that, we've got a electronic socket tray that has sensors inside to show when a bit's been removed or a socket and also to indicate uh, by a flashing light to prompt the user to use that particular socket. After that, we get to a barcode scanner. This barcode scanner is used to scan three different barcodes, including the coach serial number, the process that you want to build, and your employee badge. And all that data is stored with a database for every torque value that you perform. Okay, folks, let's build a coach. I'm gonna start off here looking at the, the last splash screen of the previous process and it gives us a little indication here we need to barcode scanner and scan three barcodes coach VIN, assembly process and associate ID. So this is the associate ID and right here is the coach VIN. So this would typically travel with the coach. We'll start there and the second one we're gonna build a coach, scan that. That's been accepted here on the screen scan my employee badge all right that's been accepted and the first thing we see on the screen is the finished product so it wants to confirm that is that the correct barcode that you scanned and uh, and we can acknowledge that by looking in the corner here and pressing a button to continue so here we go okay so first things up our bin lights on and inside the bin there's a sensor that's going to detect my hand and increment the picture to the next step automatically. So the first thing it's saying is load, chassis into fixture is shown. There we go. Press button to continue. And next bin, next part. So we've got some bearings to pick here. Quantity two. Got those out. Place bearing on chassis is shown. Okay, here we go. Got that. Press button to continue again. Okay, now we're picking some wheels. Bin lights on. Something to notice here, large diameter, small diameter. Okay, we'll take a look. Got two different size bores in this wheel. Okay, place wheels over spacers with larger diameter facing up. Okay, got that. There we are. Okay, press button to continue again. Okay, pick wheel bolts. Quantity two. Thread each wheel faster into chassis by hand as shown. Okay. There we go. Got that. Press button to continue. Okay, so now we're showing a tool in the corner here, and it says select bit from holder as indicated by flashing light. Oh, there's our flashing light on the bit tray. Pulled it out, indicates it's gone, and we're going to put it on the tool. Okay, We've got a blue light here showing our tools connect to the Wi-Fi and not sleeping. So we'll try and do a torque here. Okay. I'm holding the button down and, until a complete torque is, is finished and a light shows up. Then I can release the button. Okay, so thing to note here, we got a good torque and a good angle. You notice the torque and the angle are both very, very small. Uh, we're dealing with pretty rigid parts here that don't have any give at all. So we can expect a very, uh, a very low angle. I'll do another torque. There we go again. And we got another green torque. Okay. So we'll pull this bit off and put it back. Okay, place that. What do we have to do now? Roll, chassis, and fixture is shown. All right. There we go. Press button to continue. Okay, we're picking bearings again. Place bearings as shown. Press button to continue. Got some wheels to pull again. Let's 
good. Okay, press button to continue again. Pick wheel fasteners. So I tested this system on uh, a half dozen colleagues in my office. And they all were successful in building this truck. So basic picture with small amount of text and some little indicators tells, tells the operator what to do next. And here we are, we got another bit flashing, so we're gonna take that one out. There we go again. Should note that the speed that we're using is set in such a way that it can handle these hard joints that we're dealing with here. So every single parameter in the tool is configurable. We can configure torque, we can configure angle, and the speed of rotation, and a multitude of other things that you can get into when you really get experienced with that software. Okay, so we're ready to do a move. So you can see that time the picture incremented by itself based on the results of the torque being green. And now we're gonna go to the next step. I'm gonna place this frame on the next fixture and press continue. Okay, so now we're picking the shell. Pick that. There we go, place the shell on the chassis, continue. Some shell fasteners. Drop bolts into shell pockets. Okay, got that. Continue. Thread each fastener and chassis by hand. Two turns each, okay. There we go, okay. All right, so we're, it's indicating to pick the tool up, grab another bit. This is the other bit this time. Place it on the tool. We're doing two different torques here, so the, the torque program has automatically changed. We're doing a totally different torque this time than we did last time. And totally transparent to the operator. No setting, manual click wrenches, just pull the trigger, wait for a green light, and move on. Okay, we'll put that back. Okay, we're picking a cab this time. Get into the cab bin. Place cab on chassis as shown. Continue. Pick fasteners. Okay. There we go, drop fasteners into cab pockets. That's done, continue. And we're gonna hand tighten these guys a couple turns. Okay, good. Press button to continue. All right, we're gonna torque again. Back to the socket tray. Get on there, okay. There we go, first torque's good. And second torque. Identical angle on that, those two fastenings. Okay, put that away. Okay, so basically we are complete our assembly process. Now we're just gonna crane, pretend to crane this off of, uh, off of the last fixture. I kinda added this in here because I wanted to kinda illustrate that you don't have to be kind of tied to a bench. You can be out in the shop in a large area doing a weld mint or following weld instructions or working on a large coach with a 50 inch TV up on the wall and you can have this on your belt and you can press these buttons like indicated here, start and up and you can process through the steps of the instructions. So we just completed the first coach build. Oh, that was great. That uh, video always makes me smile, Lance. Um, thank you again for your effort in putting that together. It was uh, 
a lot of effort to to do that, but it really demonstrates well how uh, a DC electric tool system can guide an operator with operator guidance and interactive digital work instructions through a complete assembly. The uh, pick to light system and the socket tray is an ideal way to air proof. So it eliminates defects in production. I like the red lights on the bin. They really did a good job of, of guiding you to the correct parts and helped you follow the sequential steps as necessary. So in this bus build, we uh, achieved zero fault production because we did not have any missing fasteners or parts. We applied the correct torque each time. And, and as you mentioned, the tool does that automatically. So it's pre-programmed and when you select the right bit, the torque value changes automatically. And then you kept following the sequence until the build was complete. And the good thing is we get traceability for each fastener, which includes the operator's name, the date and timestamp, and every other detail that uh, went into the process to build that VIN. So COVID, we had to work around COVID. And uh, so we had to do this with some video clips. Um, in the future, we can do live demonstrations on webinars, but now Lance and I are going to take you out on the production line at MotorCoach in this next shorter video. And uh, we're going to learn more about MotorCoach's journey with advanced fastening systems and, and why they rely on them every day of the year. So this is a shorter video. We'll get it started up. So we're here at Motor Coach Industries out on the production floor after hours. It's great to be up close to the, the, the legacy D coach that we've seen on the road for years. Lance, tell me, how many years have you been using DC electric tools here at Motor Coach? At Motor Coach, we've been uh, using them since 2012, and I've been here for six of those years. Evidently, it's brought you up close to a lot of applications that DC tools are used in. For our viewers, can you tell me what are the key benefits of using DC electric tools in production? Well, I guess, uh, first of all, it's their capability to trap errors. So we can catch a lot of things before they leave the facility, even before they leave station. So having that uh, traceability in the database, the torque control, and everything that goes with it is uh, some of the best uh, advantages of DC tools. And right in front of us, we've got one of the DC tool stations here again. This one does our uh, axle installation fasteners for radius rods and, and items like that. And right here is the key example. We've got the operator guidance there. So it helps new operators, it helps old operators keep on track. It doesn't matter if they go on a coffee break, come back, they know exactly where they're at, and we don't miss any steps. And that's the key to a quality product. That's great, because you do build a quality product and having these systems in place out on the production floor in station they can provide that service for any manufacturer i see that you put a custom reaction bar on this tool to suit a unique application that, that's an excellent job that you've designed that as well to make the tool function in close clearance applications yeah this particular fastener was very difficult to reach the operators had a very hard time and it was a high torque application too so having this special reaction and the operator now just have to get the tool into position and press a trigger instead of trying to roll a torque up to 200 foot-pounds, um, it's a huge advantage and the operators love it. So that's great because it's preventing you those ergonomic risks as well. But I think that you, you go to a lot of effort to make these tools usable in production because of the benefits they bring you in the way of quality. There's a big benefit of producing a quality product with DC electric tools. Absolutely. So that uh, video, you can hear Lance reiterate why uh, Motor Coach relies on DC electric tools every day in production. That was great. Um, they can trap the errors before any assembly leaves a workstation or before the bus leaves the plant, which ensures they always build a quality product. So the DC system provides full traceability, as we've heard, for every fastening cycle, and it's stored 
in the database, which is networked at New Flyer. Uh, of course, uh, torque control is very important and operator guidance is, is huge to help minimize training and maintain confidence that they're building quality buses and keeps the operators on track as we heard, even if they go for a break. So having a power tool that prevents ergonomic risks is, is also a big advantage. It prevents them torquing manually, as Lance said, rowing up to 200 foot pounds, uh, saves you those ergonomic risks as well. So again, we're gonna have another short video to continue our discussion on the production floor and get some insight into why torque and angle control are so important. So next video. Lance, in our presentation today, you've talked a lot about torque and how important it is to achieve our target torque values. But we've also talked about angle targets and how do we achieve a, a angle parameters within certain windows. For our viewers, can you give me an example of why controlling angle measurement is so important in advanced manufacturing? Sure, I can do that. Actually, I can give you two examples. The first one would be uh, probably a cast part that's got threaded holes in it. And if it goes through a process that's where that part is painted before uh, reaching the production line for assembly, there's a chance that you can get paint in those threads. If that happens, the angle measurement that you're going to get with the DC tool will be different than your typical non-painted threaded uh, expectation. So in that case, you basically would reach your target torque earlier than you would with clean threads and then what that means is you actually have less clamp load. Clamp load is really what torque's all about. That's what holds everything together and keeps everything going down the road. So it's super important in that case to set your parameters for angle. If you reach a target torque early because your angle is low, uh, that can give you an indication you've got cross thread or paint in the threads or something like that. Uh, another example would be uh, two different types of lock nuts getting into the same bin. One's got a prevailing torque, which is the torque just to get the nut down the bolt thread without even doing anything to the joint of say 10. And the next one's got 20. Well, all of a sudden, that's a considerable amount of uh, prevailing torque that will affect your clamp load again. So here you are. You can you can set your tools to detect all those things and prevent escapes to the field. So applied torque, subtract my prevailing torque, has an effect on my clamp load or preload in the joint. We're getting pretty technical, Brian, but that's great. That's exactly what's happening. That's, that's very interesting, and I'm sure a lot of viewers will have witnessed this at some point. But there's another scenario where our angle measurements, we could go beyond our angle parameters. In that case, we might be missing a component in the assembly. In that case, we might have uh, stretched the fastener too far because of a change in our friction value. So maybe we lower friction and we increase the angle it takes. We pick up on that failure with a DC electric tool. Absolutely. Lubricated, non-lubricated threads would cause that. Another one would be uh, reusing fasteners. When you reuse a fastener, you actually condition the threads of the nut and the bolt and your clamp force actually goes up when your threads are conditioned. It changes the joint completely and you could be into the yield point of your fastener at that point. So it's very important to have controlled hardware coming into the station. Exactly. It's very important to have our plating types remain the same. It's very important that the threads aren't damaged before we use the product, right? Exactly. So when it comes packaged, it needs to be packaged correctly. There's a lot of things that go into upstream, but we find those issues when we're, we're using advanced fastening tools because they tell us about what's going on in the joint. So, Lance's examples were excellent as they provided some real life situations that explain why torque and angle control are so important. Remember, the, uh, the whole objective when fastening is, is to create clamping force. So as explained in uh, the video there, the friction 
or prevailing torque that we experience when we're running the nut down the threads of the bolt is taking away from the amount of applied torque that goes into tensioning the bolt. So maybe you have experienced paint in the threads of your parts and it affects the products that you build. Maybe your supplier has been short of the uh, standard nylon lock nuts due to COVID and has been supplying you with deformed thread lock nuts instead. As Lance mentioned, if you change the lock nut types and experience an increase in prevailing torque during the rundown, it will equate to a lower clamp load with the same torque applied. Conversely, in applications where friction is significantly reduced with a lubricant, uh, could be a liquid Loctite or a thread locker, and you continue to apply the same amount of torque from a conventional tool, like a torque wrench, you could actually be tightening your fasteners beyond their yield point and could cause those fasteners to fail in the field. So this slide on the left side, we uh, show an example of how hard joints and soft joints act differently. A hard joint is a fastening together of two components or parts that do not compress easily. So the fasteners begin to yield much sooner and the angle required is considerably lower. This is typically a joint consisting of thick metal to metal components and that is shown here, I'll get my pointer up. This is a typical hard joint condition, metal to metal, no given this joint. But a soft joint contains parts that compress easily. So we got some kind of a gasket material between. This, in this soft joint condition, the fasteners begin to yield much later and the angle is considerably higher in value. So imagine a, a thin metal component gasket being attached to another piece of metal, you're gonna experience a soft joint condition. So you can see in these angle measurements here, we can go from 5% to 100% of target torque in less than 30 degrees in a hard joint condition. In a soft joint condition, we have to turn that same fastener two times to achieve 100% of target torque. So this is kind of explained roughly in this graph here. You can see a much shorter angle curve on a hard joint condition than a much longer curve on a soft joint condition. On the right side of the slide, we've got different types of um, joints here pictured. So we've got a screw type joint going to a blind hole, a bolt and nut assembly, very common. We're gonna have a wrench on one side and the tool on the other. And then we've got a stud application, again, a different relationship here. So I'd like to you to think about what types of joints you're working with in your products. Do you find that your fasteners relax after you've tightened them the first time? Maybe it's after you do a run-up test, you'll notice a relaxation. You might notice that difference that we've mentioned with the uh, thread locker. You apply that to the threads and it feels like it's tightening easier. That is because the friction is lower and you're applying more clamp load. Maybe you've also experienced that uh, galling in stainless steel hardware and you tighten the nut and it jams with the bolt and the whole thing starts turning in the hole. So as strange as it may seem, any changes in these joints, so even if we're using a, one type of hardware in a joint and uh, someone comes along and changes it, the plating type, or suggests using a different length or changing the head style, all of these things can change the uh, final clamp load in the joint. And even going from fine thread to coarse thread makes a change. So the good news is, whatever those changes are, we can accurately control the parameters in the tool so that we can overcome those changes. That's with DC electric tools, these advanced tightening strategies. We've got torque control, angle control. We can do torque and angle control, torque or angle control. There's many different strategies. This colored picture on the right side shows how the tool reports on the result. So the aim is to get the result, the, the tool to stop within this green box here. So we're setting these parameters for torque, we're setting these parameters for angle, 
in the programming screens. You can see here uh, in the backdrop, there's a programming screen. And you can see this is what a typical scope would, oscilloscope graph would look like. That is what we're trying to program for. In this screen in the foreground of this slide, this is a result screen from the database. You can see how this curve with the red arrow is much different than the numerous correct curves that we've got here represented by this green arrow. So this is what the curve should look like. This one here has had a difference. So this could have started angle early because of paint in the threads as an example. So in this next and last short video, we're gonna be talking further about this data that we receive from each fasting cycle and how we understand what that data represents. So when I say telling us about what's going on in the joint, there's these traces or curves, we call them a torque over angle or torque over time. We can compare the data bits in many ways, but we get a thousand data bits from every fastening cycle lens. Tell us, how do you analyze that data to adjust parameters in your existing applications or even when you're designing new applications with engineering? Right. Well, engineering's got a, a basic requirement for the clamp load required, how many pounds of force are required to hold that joint together. And then they select a fastener based on those parameters. And at that point, you can start doing tests with a DC tool. You can torque those fastenings multiple times using new hardware each time and get a whole bunch of data on angle and traces. And you can watch these things and do statistical measurements and calculations in the database, which it does it for you actually, um, right afterwards and set your angle limits so that you're matching the capability of your fastening joint. And then when it goes outside that, you've got a problem. It's very interesting. And thank you for mentioning the database again, because these curves are stored for every fastening cycle, aren't they? They sure are, yeah. We often refer to those sometimes when we're having problems, sometimes when we just want to prove that, you know, we're, we're on track. Yeah, so you can go back and make sure you're maintaining those original parameters that you initially set. Exactly. That's very important. Thanks for coming to Motor Coach, Brian. Thank you, Lance. I really enjoyed the opportunity to work with you and put this presentation together for our viewers. I'm sure it's going to be very meaningful to them. Great. So that was the uh, last video for today's presentation. Um, we'll touch base on a few of these details about the database. And you can see it's uh, very important that New Flyer has a CVI NetWeb database installed. It's a huge benefit to them in many ways, as Lance has already explained. All the results can be made available to any authorized user to view on a web-based device that can be can access the database from the production floor. So this will give you the visibility to confirm if your operators torqued each faster on a particular vehicle or product that you build. It'll also give you the final torque values. So the controller itself will store 10,000 results. The database actually is an ongoing uh, database. It um, updates every 10 seconds from all controllers that are connected to the database. So it gives you real-time access to the fastening results, including the curves, the curves that are so important to, to monitor and measure. Now, this data can all be filtered, queried, and reports can be processed. The full statistical analysis, you can see here on the screen, we've got some statistical analysis and a Six Sigma representation. Um, this database shows a nice green uh, results screen. Everything is going well here. Oops, this database screen shows that we've got some issues happening here. What's going on? Well, they can move on until those reds or yellows are overcome. So you can see, you can drill into each line and row and filter, create reports of this information. It's, it's very powerful and, and it obviously makes the whole system successful for the manufacturer. 
So next slide. As the suitor creates trends in the marketplace, they also make advancements to their full suite of software. Uh, we use CVI config to program the equipment, including all the network configurations for the Wi-Fi tools. We write our parameter sets here in our assembly process controls and monitor. We use this software to remotely monitor fastening results on the production line or when we're setting up new tools as it happens. So that's again, real time. And then engineering typically is using the CVI analyzer software to drill into specific case study fastening results offline. But CVI NetWeb also has many of those capabilities. So if you're already at phase one or two in the uh, journey here with torque and batch control. So torque control first, and then we can start doing batch control for your standard joints, you're on your way. Uh, from there, we can go through uh, joint control and station control for quality critical and safety critical joints. This can take some time uh, to implement for sure. As you can see in Sheldon and Lance's videos, they've put in tons of time to make this uh, successful. While they might be at different phases too, um, both of them are making great progress towards achieving zero fault fastening. The ultimate goal, of course, is to get to line control or plan control, but no matter how you proceed on your journey, uh, we're here to help you make progress. All of this equipment from DeSuter has made industry 4.0 advancements achievable in manufacturing. Here you can see a brief introduction to our Connect DeSuter Connect ecosystem. Uh, this has been developed with flexibility in mind for factories of the future where change will happen by the hour. Uh, Data-driven solutions are the future and will be part of your industry 4.0 journey at some point. So Applevast represents DeSuter industrial tools in the marketplace, and we use DeSuter tools and accessories in our presentation today, so I wanted to introduce them to you as well. They're a global company that is over 106 years young, and as a company with a highly innovative spirit, their headquarters and manufacturing facilities are in France, and they maintain customer centers and service operations with 1,500 employees in 50 countries around the world. So one amazing thing about DeSuter is they're efficient, International Distribution Center in Europe. They ship goods to us by air freight and we receive them three to five days later. So they're leading the industry with their DC electric tools and softwares and accessories that will help manufacturers like you reach your industry 4.0 goals. So to summarize, um, Applevast can help you overcome issues in your manufacturing environments and gain the advantages that DC tools provides you. We, we touch on all the points we've talked about. Again, the slide will be part of this presentation, but uh, understand that Applevast has the experience and uh, technical expertise to help you do this in your facility. So to deliver you the best solutions, we're asking to please bring us into your problems as early as possible. It's beneficial that you contact us early in the process so we can assist you with the design elements that otherwise might become missed opportunities later on in your process. We also provide a complete solution. So from the initial concept to installation of the equipment and training, we call that a, a smart start, right through to the annual calibration and preventative maintenance of your DC electric tools, Applevast is here to help you. That brings me to the brings us all to the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, recording is going to be posted on vtci.ca and on Applefast website. From there, you'll have access to more digital resources. I've listed my contact details here. So feel free to follow Applefast on LinkedIn for more inf inf informative content and uh, connect with me so we can chat together about your applications. We're hosting uh, virtual demonstrations and as soon as we can be back on site, we will be. Once again, I want to recognize uh, Sheldon Schultz of New Flyer in Minnesota and Lance Mlodzinski of Motor Coach in Winnipeg for their time, effort, and ongoing support. I really appreciate that. And I also want to thank Ron Vanneries of uh, Vehicle Technology Center for bringing us all together today to advance the use of technology in manufacturing heavy vehicles and equipment. So, Ron, 
Back to you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, Lance, and Sheldon. Um, now is the time for uh, questions and answers. And uh, basically, look into the Q&A feature here on the uh, webinar. Uh, we've got a couple of questions up. I'm going to start with one is, um, let's say that I'm a manufacturer. And oh, yeah, I should ask uh, Lance and Sheldon to turn on the cameras and unmute themselves as well. So you guys can meet them. Um, so I'm a manufacturer and I want to uh, identify which vehicles that I'm torquing wheels on and I want to keep that in a database um, using a connected tool uh, similar to what you've presented here. Uh, what magnitude of money would I need to set up a single assembly line with a, um, with a wheel torque installation? I'll leave that, that's to Brian. Thanks, Ron. It's a big question because um, there's a lot of variables to that to that answer. But uh, if we could talk about a single spindle, so one tool and a cable and a controller, um, the the tool is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of ten thousand uh, dollars, but a complete working system in the neighborhood of twenty five thousand dollars. So of course, you can take that many ways. You can attach multiple tools to a specific controller with the wireless technology, so it brings all those costs down. But really we have to look at what's the return on investment in our, in our factories. And there's many aspects of that value analysis too, including what are the risks of not doing it? So hopefully yep. that gives some insight. Yeah, and $5,000 a wheel off, it uh, pays it for itself pretty quick if you're yeah. uh, having to deal with fines, right? Um, right. Yeah. I'm gonna ask Lance this next one. This comes from Blair Hamilton. Uh, the demos have focused more on production line rather than a maintenance line. How portable is the equipment? say for field engineers or maintainers uh, of assets on a work site. And I noticed in that last uh, couple of videos that your, uh, your setup was actually on a cart. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And one, uh, one addition that you couldn't see just out of the frame of the video was uh, a UPS. So we, we typically will set up these systems with an uh, uninterruptible power supply. And that way we can wheel them around the factory as needed. Um, for, for whatever reason, um, out of station work, if we uh, have it have a part shortage or what have you, that way the tool can actually still perform the work we need to do. So that might suit uh, someone that needs to haul this equipment to uh, to a job site. Excellent. So if I is it possible? Um, I'll, I'll ask this one to Brian. Uh, if I'm uh, remote maintenance and I'm using these tools, can it store data and then upload data when I get back to my facility? Or do you have to be connected to Wi-Fi at all times in order to capture the information that you're, uh, that you're generating? So when we're on wireless communication, there's a limited number of uh, curves that we can uh, store in the tool because of the size of the, the package, the data package, but we can certainly store the torque and angle results and then come back into contact with the access point and then that data transmits from the tool to the controller. And then if the controller is connected to a database, the controller transmits that data to the database. So the database is usually installed on a database server. So, you know, if you're doing something out in the field and you could take a tool and do the fastenings and bring it back within range of the access point and upload it, um, I think you would get 10 okay curves, 10 not okay curves, but you would get hundreds of torque and angle results and those would upload automatically when in range with the access point again. Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna ask this one to Sheldon. Um, can the software integrate with existing ERP software systems so that torque results can be recorded against equipment assemblies, et cetera, linked to electronic job cards? Does, I guess part of the question is, is does the, the data reside in desolder or can it be exported to uh, vehicle files or vehicle specific folders? Um, well, what's, what's your thoughts on that? So you guys saved the toughest question for Sheldon. Uh, I, I really think that uh, I would like to defer this one to Brian. I know that there is some capability to use different fastening uh, software systems via open protocol, but um, I guess uh, I've really never had to use that. I've never had a system set up that way. It's all good. Brian? 
Thanks, Ronan. Thanks, Sheldon. So, yes, the uh, answer is that the database is an SQL database and could be queried with any ERP system. It, of course, would have to be formatted according to that particular person's needs. But yet there's many ways of exporting the data from the database. Uh, typically, the, the quality department or engineering or production is looking at the database and they have um, and we are going to do another webinar specifically on this. So whoever is listening should watch for that on the VTC webinar list. But to answer the question more clearly, you can create your own reporting. And that can be exported in Excel PDF. There's several different formats that can, that can come out of the system. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So we're going to go back to Lance with this one. Um, how long does it take to program and configure the steps in the software, uh, in the software for the lights on the bins, et cetera, that demonstration that you did? Um, you know, is there a significant investment in time required? Um, maybe talk about how easy pulling the documentation into, like, obviously you've got an SOP there that you hit the mushroom button and page through. Is that just um, commonly available software you would use to create that, or is that a proprietary disorder thing? Can you, can you give us a little bit of insight there? Yeah, the software running the operator guidance is, uh, called CVI HMI. It's, uh, it's just the software that they provide, um, and it communicates with the controller, um, in terms of time and effort involved, um, that particular truck build that we watched the video of was about 56 steps long. Um, taking the photos of each step and all that um, and doing the programming. Um, honestly, the photos took longer to, uh, to get on the screen than it did to actually do any programming. So um, the overhead to set that whole system up was uh, like a few days. So not long. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, I can, you know, you, you think about the current process today where usually a log travels with a vehicle and the, the log will state that this particular bolt has to be torqued to 85 foot pounds. The only guarantee you have is you know who did it and that it's at least 85 foot pounds if it's done properly. Whereas with the, uh, with the tools that have been presented here, you can actually uh, know that that was 87.2 foot pounds of torque, uh, how many rotations it took to get there. Uh, one of the questions I had was um, if somebody were to slip a prevailing torque lock nut in with a bunch of uh, nylock lock nuts, could you, is it possible that the system could lock that operation out knowing that there's something wrong with that joint? I'm going to ask that to Sheldon. Um, does it have that kind of sensitivity? Like if you were looked at the angles and the, uh, and, and the loads, the torques, uh, can it pick that up and actually lock that yeah. operation out? Absolutely. Yeah. So the prevailing torque of that particular nut is going to be outside the window of the angle that you created for the nut that you're using in production. So if, yeah, what it would recognize it as is being below the angle limit uh, or above the angle limit and you're you're not you're, you're controlling torque and angle let's say on that strategy um, so it would reject it and usually you know like at a new flyer we usually give it one retry and if it's still with outside that parameter it's going to lock that tool out uh, will, will not allow you to proceed and it will not allow you to finish your assembly process um, so we have all of our stations set up that way um, so when that happens it's going to you know, alert um, a supervisor or someone like myself to come over, unlock that tool to start asking those questions about what happened. And hopefully that leads you to, uh, we've had a change with this, uh, this particular nut. So let me ask you this is uh, between Lance and Sheldon, both of you guys, what's the, what's the most surprising thing that you were able to uh, sense or the most surprising thing you were able to learn through the integration of this technology? Um, maybe something that you didn't expect. I could, I could Go take ahead, that Lance. one. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, one surprise that I found um, was uh, 
We have a stainless steel plate that's holding a lot of our, uh, some of our pulleys on the drive belt, uh, air conditioning drive belt system. And uh, we're torquing these and strange things are happening. It, I, c I can't really explain what was happening, um, but the end result was the tool was detecting that there was wax from a milling finish on, on the plate itself that we were bolting this pulley to. So the tool was finding it, um, we're detecting problems but I couldn't explain why, but finally, by the time we, we root caused this, it came down to the finish of the stainless steel plate, which had changed, and all of a sudden the tool caught that. So very happy to catch things like that. My goodness, that's sensitive, wow. I, I would just say in general, the surprising thing for me since we started this was when we first introduced these tools and start giving them to our production folks and get them in their hands, they were very hesitant and reluctant to want to use them. Why are you doing this complicated process? What, what is the reason for this, right? And, you know, you give it to them and three months later, if you have one of those tools that's got, uh, you know, gets sent, uh, taken out of service, let's say for calibration or any reason why that tool, they can't use it for the day, they, they're upset. You know, as soon as they start using those tools, they love them. Um, they don't want to go back. They want to continue using them and, and trying to go back to, you know, reverting back to the old process is, uh, you know, something they're not interested in doing. Well, that leads actually wonderfully to the next question here. Chad's asking, what are the differences in vibration between these tools and other options? Not exactly sure what the other options are. How does this help the team on the production floor? Like I noticed that those tools are virtually silent. Um, yeah. So there, there's more than likely not a lot of um, vibration. I would assume that there's a little less reaction torque because you're in control of how fast you're, you're fastening. Is there anything else you can add to that? I'll, I'll fire that one over to Sheldon. Yeah, I mean, vibration, it's kind of hard to quantify that, but I think, you know, you know uh, having one of these tools uh, in a production uh, environment, you, you know, we want to make sure that they're not exceeding, let's say, I think uh, our limit's about 80 foot pounds before we're going to add a reaction arm on there so that, you know, they're not, they're, they're able to hold that reaction force. Anything over that, we're going to want to put a uh, reaction bar or, or mount it to an articulating arm, but the tools are very quiet, um, easy to use. You're not, you know, having to, um, you know, turn it manually, you're just pulling the trigger until it turns green. Um, so there's, it's virtually uh, going from, you know, you know, a, a click wrench where you're manually turning this tool, having to set the tool to putting the tool on the joint and pulling the trigger. So, you know, vibration, I would say is, it's minimal, it's, it's negligible. Yeah, I'd like to add to that too, uh, in terms of the vibration, um, for the higher torques, a lot of times we'd run them up with an air tool and that's where the vibration and, and uh, repetitive strain injuries will come in, right? So when you don't have to do that, um, following your, your, your air tools, following up with a click wrench, you can just use the DC tool right from the start. And like, like Sheldon said, you press a button, you got no impact to the operator. Operator loves it and, uh, and it, it makes it easier on everyone. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions coming through. So I think with that, we're going to end this webinar. Uh, thanks to Brian and uh, the team at AppleFast. His, uh, Brian's contact information is on the screen there. If you're interested in more information about Desauter, thanks to Lance and Sheldon from the New Flyer Group, New Flyer MCI. And uh, thanks to your, uh, your company as well for allowing the time to uh, be able to work with Brian in order to put together this presentation. It is sure nice to... Um, uh, hear what other manufacturers in Manitoba are doing and some of the advanced technologies that they have in-house and uh, hearing it firsthand from people that are using it sometimes is, uh, is better than, uh, you know, getting a, a random email saying, hey, you should be doing this. So uh, thank you very much for your time and your effort in all this. And uh, the webinar will be posted later this afternoon on btci.ca. And uh, in case you missed it, or there's somebody in your organization that you, uh, you think would, be, uh, would find it a benefit to watch. So with that, we're gonna sign off. Thank you very much to everybody and uh, have a great uh, remainder of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. Yep, have a good one.
Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it.